legalizefreedom.com. Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host, Greg Moffat, and my guest today is James Howard Kunstler. To quote the opening lines from the 1979 science fiction series, The Quatermass Conclusion, in the last quarter of the 20th century, the whole world seemed to sicken. Civilized institutions, whether old or new, fell, as if some primal disorder was reasserting itself. And men asked themselves, why should this be? Fast forward to the first quarter of the 21st century, and we find ourselves in much the same quandary, living in what seems like an increasingly absurd dystopian movie. To quote my guest, everything organized at the gigantic scale is steaming toward failure. Big governments, giant companies, the huge capital investment firms, global shipping, energy production, chain retailing, mass motoring, big electricity, big medicine, big education, big anything. But there's more to our predicament than mere systems failure. Consumerist culture tells us that life has no meaning or purpose beyond material concerns and led to a crisis in our collective consciousness, manifesting nihilism and insanity on a hitherto unimaginable scale. Can we unmake this unhuman death wish before it's too late? Hello and welcome, James, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. It's a pleasure to be with you, Greg. James, we've spoken uh, several times before in the past. Uh, last time was back in March 2020, talking about living in the long emergency. We've also spoken about your book published many years ago, The Geography of Nowhere. Um, coming up, you've just uh, put out a new anthology of blog posts. You can tell us about that in a moment. It's called Crazy Land, Dispatches on the Great American Derangement of our time. Before we, before we jump into our chat, just give a very quick potted bio for listeners who may not be familiar with your work. Well, I'm the author of about 20 books, uh, best known for some of my nonfiction, The Geography of Nowhere, which is about the fiasco of suburban development, mostly about the USA. Um, the Long Emergency, which came out in uh, 2005, which is about the uh, really about the economic collapse uh, that we're now facing. It just has taken uh, almost 20 years for it to, to occur after I predicted it. I wrote a book called Too Much Magic, and the subtitle was Wishful Thinking Technology and the Fate of the Nation, which might give you an idea what it was about. I published a popular four novel series called The World Made by Hand series. And uh, those four novels, all of them have different title, uh, are uh, a depiction of what life would be like in a small town, a village in uh, America's New England region after an economic collapse. And I did that because I wanted readers to really uh, kind of sensually uh, uh understand what it would feel like to live in that new disposition of things. So uh, I, I publish my uh, blog twice a week on Mondays and Fridays. It comes out at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, New York time on Monday and Friday, and it's pretty popular. And that's what I do these days. Okay, you just reminded me actually that aside from the two interviews that we did previously that I mentioned, we also did one around Too Much Magic. Listeners can find those linked up on this interview page at legalizefreedom.com. It's all there. So, well, today is quite a momentous day, I think, because uh, this is a Thursday, the 27th? 7th. 27th. Correct. And it is tonight, I believe, that the first debate is due to take place between U.S. presidential candidates, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Is that correct? Yes, it's the uh, greatest battle since uh, Godzilla and Mothra got right, together. Yeah, exactly. Only this one's between uh, Godzilla and a potato chip. 
<laughs> well, so we're going to be obviously we're going to start talking about the political situation your side of the pond, but. Uh, listeners, uh, you know, don't tune out immediately. We're going to be talking about a lot of other stuff. This isn't just U.S. politics, but I had to start there because today being what it is. Now, you've written. Yeah, it's momentous. You've written, and uh, I've you know, agreed that I said, well, surely the Democrats cannot allow this shell of a man, Biden, to go up on in television, albeit, I understand, not in front of a live audience. But how can they allow this to happen? But I don't know what the latest intelligence you have is, but it looks like it's going ahead. Oh, it's going ahead all right. Um, it, you know, it's a little bit skewed uh, in in terms of fairness in the sense that there are two uh, viciously anti-Trump uh, uh, people monitoring their, or uh, uh, conducting the, the debate. Uh, and um, one of them, in fact, Dana Bash, uh, her husband uh, is a CIA employee who was a part of the Russiagate uh, hoax. So that's pretty sketchy. And of course, Jake Tapper of uh, NBC, I guess, has made no secret of uh, his loathing for Mr. Trump and he's expressed it many times. And he's he has uh, spread many uh, untruths about him and, you know, fake news stories about him. The whole thing's very unfortunate. But, uh, you know, I, I think Mr. Trump can handle himself and he's prepared. We have been advised by the uh, our, uh, shall we say, conservative uh, uh, advisors not to underestimate. Ex yes, not to underestimate Joe Biden, that uh, he can if they jack him up on enough chemicals, he can probably perform for the roughly 38 minutes that he will have to talk within the hour and a half of the debate uh minus the many commercial breaks and mr trump's remarks so he may he may be able to uh, put together quite a few coherent sentences the problem for mr biden is that no matter how jacked up he is he has no record that he can defend everything that he's been doing for the last three years has helped wreck our country and destroy institutions I think that if Mr. Trump remains calm and simply spells these things out for the audience and for Joe Biden so that he can hear about them maybe for the first time, because I'm not even quite sure he's getting uh, correct information about the, the economy. Uh, um, I think that he'll uh, do a good job. Uh, you know, if he if he starts uh, acting childish, uh, that'll be another matter. And he's capable of acting childish. Yeah, well, of course, you're very correct to point out Biden's record, um, such as it is. Uh, so it's one thing if he goes up on stage and poops his pants and then walks off, uh, you know, stage right and <laughs> just in a daze. But it's, but it's another if he is relatively coherent. Uh, but of course, the um, the question then is, as you say, is, will Trump, you know, behave himself? Will he just steady himself, stay on point? You know, and, uh, and and not get too carried away with his own. You know, as he does sometimes, uh, he can be his own worst enemy. So. Sure, I, I I think that part of the the deal will be that my guess is that Trump will probably have better preparation than Joe Biden, and uh, I I simply think he's got better advisors and they're they're more intelligent, and uh, uh, a lot of the people around Joe Biden are really kind of out to lunch. And, uh, um, you know, then there's the fact that he himself has severe limitations. So I think that's that'll be a big deal. Now, sitting where I am and looking at this situation, and this will probably sound hopelessly naive uh, to someone like yourself. And even though, as I say, I'm an avid reader of your, your output on all topics, including U.S. politics. But I was thinking, like, there's a question of like, can, and I've got American work colleagues actually, we talked a little bit about this, about is this really the best that the two main sides in, in, the, uh, in the political system there can come up with? You know, aren't there younger, you know, more capable people? Oh, it's people? pitiful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But in, from the Democratic point of view, I was thinking like, why are they pushing on with what looks like the suicide mission? Wouldn't it be sometimes in battle, you just think we just need to temporarily withdraw, regroup, rearm and come back, you know, let the enemy have a bit of ground. You know, we can retake that. So 
isn't there any element within <laughs> the Democrat, democratic establishment that was saying, you know, we just let this one go? Let this one go. Well, Greg, it really is baffling. It is absolutely uh, impossible to understand why the Democratic Party would want to put this guy up for a re-election. You know, he's clearly incapable, and he's clearly done an enormous amount of damage to the United States in every way imaginable, to its its reputation, uh, our system of, of law, um, our, our institutions, our, our cultural habits. He's like he's like the Jacobins to the third order of magnitude. You know how the Jacobins during the French Revolution worked really hard to disorder French society by doing things like changing the number of days in the week and the number of months in the calendar and and, uh, you know, all sorts of other things that they perpetrated. And uh, but, you know, the, their opponents got on to them uh fairly uh, uh, early in the game. And after a year of being in power, they got kicked out and uh, got their heads chopped off. And that was the end of the Jacobins. This particular faction is even more bewildering. Uh, Either they represent some kind of strange, globalist, demonic uh, cabal, which in in itself raises, you know, strange... uh, uh, kind of metaphysical questions that sound too weird to be true, uh, or there's some kind of sickness in the zeitgeist itself, and and that may be. Uh, I, I'm coming around to the view that the collective consciousness and actually and unconsciousness of a nation or a people or a group can be subject to some pretty strange um, uh, influences that seem to be beyond the mere sum of their collective psychologies. And, uh, you know, we're we're all baffled by this. You know, why would the, this party want to put up this guy who's clearly incapable of doing the job? And, and it was true four years ago when they first put him up and he ran that miserable, stupid campaign in, out of his basement. And now when he, he can barely walk across the lawn from his helicopter to the White House. So so there you go. Uh, on the other hand, I must say that uh, the um, affairs of the Europeans, to some extent, are almost uh, more baffling than the things that are going on in the USA. And, and that, too, seems to be a strange uh, zeitgeist issue that that the the best efforts of well-intentioned uh, a well-intentioned opposition can't do anything about yeah you know, it's it was... interesting to see mr farage emerge because uh you know from my point of view overseas watching british politics for the you know for in recent years he he really seems to be the only coherent voice on the scene and yet he has been unable to really emerge with any kind of uh, force until now. Yeah, and, well, I mean, he was, sort of, he was on the scene a few years ago with UK, oh, yeah. you know, the UK Independence Party, and that looked like actually it was going to be a thing. Uh, yeah, but then, and they, then it just flopped. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. So we'll see if that happens again. We'll get to the European situation uh, very shortly. It's fundamentally the same phenomenon you, or manifestation of, of whatever it is you mentioned. You, you start yeah. to get in, you start to get into Jungian territory, don't you? Really, and, and the idea exactly of, uh, the idea of uh, egregores. You know, the idea that a nation has a sort of over soul that can become, you know, corrupt. Yeah. And, uh, and in fact, uh, I'm reading a wonderful book about it by a guy named Simon Sheridan. He's an Australian, and he wrote a book called The Devouring Mother. The Devouring Mother is is a Jungian archetype, and it basically incorporates the properties of a a cluster B personality mother, you know, the kind of mother who sets a a child up for extreme dependency and failure, and the kind of mother who will, will do something like the Munchausen by proxy syndrome, where they get off on, uh, uh, presenting their child as being sick and, and, you know, carting the child around to doctors and hospitals when the child is not sick. And, uh, you know, that's uh, definitely a, a thing. That's some, 
thing that has been observed. And so uh, Sheridan's thesis is uh, that this, um, you know, oversoul of a nation can uh, adopt the the ways of the, of a um, an archetypal figure and really work a lot of evil hoodoo on the nation. Did you? Oh, and uh... there's there's another component to it, which is that the citizens. Uh, you know, uh, a certain portion of the citizens become the compliant, abused child who tries desperately to please this devouring parent who uh, cannot stop harming it. And, you know, you get into a dynamic relationship that is extremely negative. And that's exactly what we saw with the people who, uh, who still are getting their, you know, ninth booster shot of a vaccine that practically everybody has heard is not safe and in fact is probably extremely harmful and uh, it's an amazing phenomenon uh coming out of the 1950s and 60s as i did as a as a child and a young man you know this was a period after world war ii where we really thought that we had arrived in some kind of golden age of psychological stability for the human race. Uh, you know, the maybe we considered the Soviets to be somewhat aberrant, but on the whole, as far as Western civilization was concerned, we thought that we were doing pretty well and that we had kind of abolished all the devils that had plagued Western Civ for four centuries. But, you know, I, I, I'm so fascinated by... The, the illusion of all that, because now we're finding ourselves in an age that's every bit as crazy as some of the medieval or God poisoning uh, episodes and, and, and other hysterias, uh, classic hysterias that took place in, you know, in earlier times. And I, I've never seen people behave so crazily as as we're seeing now. I don't think we banished any demons whatsoever. I just think that we told ourselves a different story collectively. And, and you know, in terms of like from the, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, then, you know, materialism as a cosmology and as, also as a worldview. So the 50s and 60s, you were talking about post-war boom. It was all cars and holidays and blenders and washing machines and TVs and the devils yeah. and the atomic demons. energy and hopes for the future. Yeah, and, yeah. So the, you know, the, 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 that didn't deal that didn't um our psychology was still the same it's just that we were i say we were just relating to the world differently because of that and of course when that stuff that material stuff started to crack and crumble and those systems come under pressure we found ourselves back facing the same you know like inner darkness yet again so um, well with, with the united states it was actually a very long and corrosive five decades you know, including the Vietnam episode, the fiasco of Vietnam, that really started the uh, institutional failure in the USA. And it's taken an awful long time to un unwind. But, uh, you know, it's now the damage seems to be accelerating and ramifying so that so that, you know, every problem with an institution makes the other problems of other institutions nearby proximate to it even worse did you by any chance read john michael greer's book the king in orange um, i actually did um i can't say that i remember it that well but you know i follow greer a little bit and i talk to him once in a while um he's got an interesting mind yeah it's just the reason i mentioned it is we're talking about Jungian ideas and i i think there's more to be gleaned from looking askance at what's going on in the world at the moment in terms of, you know, politics, economics, culture, society, and trends, even technology, looking under the hood of this thing uh, inside ourselves. I think there's a lot more we can learn, but of course that sort of uh, analysis is not at all popular. Everything's superficial, literally and, and met metaphorically, you know? Yeah. So I, I think that's well, we're what, still sort of uh, bound into this uh, uh, globe of, uh, logical positivism and you know all the early 20th century mm. uh, kind of scientific uh, uh, claptrap uh, yeah. ideology but yeah. I, I also would say that I, I think you're simply less naive than I am you know uh, having grown up in that extraordinarily hopeful period of the 1950s and uh, you know uh, 
fairly peaceful. Um, uh, you know, I, I I just think that what seems normal to me has really been bygone for quite a long time. And people who were born in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you know, don't feel the same way about it than, that I do. Yeah, well, we didn't get a microwave or a, a video recorder until 1985. You know what I mean? So <laughs> and uh -huh. we, we thought that was that was the latest thing. But of course, yeah. uh, microwaves and video recorders have been in the, available in the States for long. I'm using that just as a, you know, little silly bellwether things. But yeah, um, uh, and we, I, I remember when I got my first telephone voice message machine, it was like 1985. And I, I was I was a starving bohemian at the time. I had so much fun with that thing. Uh, the first message I put on it was something like, uh, hello, you've reached the offices of God Almighty. I I'm not here right now. Actually, I'm everywhere. But if you leave me a message, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't think we got a, a, a answering machine until like uh, well into the 90s. So anyway, I mean, that brings us then, I guess, over to my side of the pond in Europe. And But whatever is occurring this side of the uh, Atlantic is, is you know, so, so it's happening everywhere and, and all yeah. over the world with different manifestations. But one of the, the big talking points or the, the, the sort of buzzwords, buzz phrases, uh, things that people are ragging on here in the media and the political scene is the rise of the right, in, you know, quote unquote. Now, I looked at a couple of UK media articles concerning this forthcoming US presidential debate. And the last one I read was in The Guardian a guy being critical of Trump. And I was reading through it, quite a short article, but it, I, it was so, it just had nothing. It just said when the debate was happening and extolling the virtues of Biden. And at the end, all it could do was once again, talk about Trump, what he stood for. And, you know, when was the last time we had something like this, you know, and, and just basically didn't say it in so many words, but it was Nazi Germany again. It's just Trump yeah. and Hitler. And that's it's just like it's all that they And of course, you know, they're just projecting their own behavior mm. because, uh, you know, if, if anybody is totalitarian, it's the left in America and Europe. You know, they're the ones who are trying to shut down free speech. They're the ones who are using police state tactics to, you know, do home invasions of the FBI and the, the Stasi like uh, national police operation. Uh, they're the ones who uh, are disordering uh, the institutions. Um, they're the ones who are using lawfare, which is a term in America that we use for, uh, you know, trumped up, cooked up false charges, using the machinery of law to um, persecute your political opponents. So they're doing all of that. And and also they're you know they're very avid for World War Three, and you know the strange thing is is that uh, I I was a registered Democrat uh, in that party uh, for forty years, and uh, you know so I started in the nineteen sixties, and the Democrats were the party of peace in those days. Now they're the party of war. They they flipped on everything, and yet they you know they're using the psychological the sick psychotic uh cluster b uh, psychological projection to project all of the evil acts that they're undertaking on their opponents and the other part of that that is equally astounding is how ineffectual their uh, their opponents have been on the right well the uh some of the establishment in uh in the uk and europe I've been getting quite a lot of bother recently. You know, it's it, it's just like it, just the latest uh, step in a in a sort of trend. You know, but their kind of charade has become increasingly hard to sustain. Like Emmanuel Macron in France um, having uh -huh. tremendous problems. Uh, the Irish Premier Leo Varadkar recently, um, a creature of the globalists, uh, re, you know, mm -hmm. recently resigning. So it's actually, you know, there are, we're starting to see stuff. You know, actual kinetic action in the political scene as opposed to just the threat of and yes one of and you the, are after all having elections sooner than we are yeah exactly so both the, yeah, in the france UK, and uk yeah the uk elections coming up very soon i mean that, that's another it has parallels with the us in the sense that you've got two basically unelectable what i call um uh hair helmets you know guys with yeah. hair, you know they, they when they swivel their heads their hair stays in the same place uh, you got these two just totally interchangeable characters 
And yeah. uh, so it's going to be either way. It's like, it's like, what, what to, do you want mustard or mayo on your shit sandwich? You know, it's really, that's the choice. You're looking, you <laughs> it's <know>. terrible. <laughs> yeah. It's um, terrible. But immigration, but, um, I mean, oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. I, I got to ask you, do you think that there will be any surprises in the UK elections that maybe the, uh, the, the, both parties uh, are even more unpopular than, than the, the uh, media realizes? Politics to me really is poison. And I know you follow the U.S. scene closely because of yeah. your, your coverage. Um, well, it is poisonous. Yeah. But so I'm not paying that close attention. But of course, if you're a sentient being, then the information about this stuff comes to you anyway. It seems to me yeah, that, sure. the, that the conservatives, the, the, the equivalent of the Republicans, cannot win this. It's just it's just been won. And it doesn't look like they're really trying, to be honest. I think they're in that uh -huh. position I was talking about. They think we're going to sit this one out. Uh, and it's a poison chalice. It looks like Labour will probably win by default because, again, it's the lesser of two evils. It's kind of, well, we're not going to elect the Conservatives, therefore being this two-party system effectively. Labour is the only other choice. Um, but it'll be, it'll be just as dismal. But as to whether we'll get any surprises, it could happen. Uh, certainly, the, if a Brexit is anything to go by, then the media will not necessarily present an accurate picture of what's happening out there you know, in, in, the, in the streets, as it were. So it's possible that there could be some surprises, you know, in, uh, in, in different seats going to like third parties. But I don't mm -hmm. know, I don't yet know what, like Nigel Farage, you mentioned him, what his party are doing really in the polls. Uh, you know, I'm not that interested, mm -hmm. in, but we'll find out soon enough. But it's mm -hmm. a very, it's a, it is a very, never been a more uh, unstable, volatile situation, I would say. So I certainly wouldn't be putting a lot of money on any party. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Um, but I mentioned. Well, I, I just wanted to say about uh, Europe and and the war in Ukraine is this mad, mad insistence on pretending that they're going to go rushing in there with NATO troops. You know, there there's no way that NATO can marshal any kind of a. Uh, of an army with any potency at all to go in there and assist the Ukrainians. It's absurd. You know, the UK especially, which, you know, I think has perhaps the smallest force, uh, military force that it's had in decades. And, you know, the rest of them are really no better. And uh, so it's very hard to understand why uh, Olaf Scholz and uh, Sunak and and Macron and the whole gang are militating to to um, make this war in Ukraine as bad as possible. I think it's we'll just have to look at it as another manifestation of that psychosis that we're talking about. Yeah, I well, I look, guess looking sure. at people that are actually certifiable, uh, you know, I just don't recognize that human, you know, humanity as I understand it in these people. Uh, it really is like a, a different race in some ways. I do want to, you know, I was re-watching the, uh, after Donald Sutherland died, I was re-watching the 1978 version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And oh, yeah, great. Sometimes it feels like that's the sort of world we're Absolutely. living in. Absolutely. Uh, like your brains have been taken over by some strange alien force. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, the Ukraine thing is completely bizarre, but I mean, if, I think you probably called it right when you said that if it doesn't tip over into some kind of real like uh kinetic uh military disaster that um there'll be some kind of fudging it'll go you know read it. basically it'll go back to the, the way it was um in some form before you know that uh ukraine has been in the sphere of influence of russia for a very long time uh one of the things that got this whole mess going was uh the ukrainian so, you know, leadership to sort of Western stooges kind of shelling ethnic Russians within Ukrainian territory. That was prompted by the U.S. and the CIA and the State Department. Yeah. You know, they wanted to destabilize Ukraine, thinking that they could use that as a launching pad to destabilize Russia and uh, break up uh, Russia into an even smaller set of uh, uh, sovereign entities than it is now and destroy its economy and basically turn it into a third world part of the globe. But that was uh, an extremely grandiose ambition and, and foolish. 
and the thing has turned into a giant fiasco. And what seems to be happening, luckily for the West, is that Vladimir Putin is showing the most amazing Christian patience of probably any leader faced with with a similar situation in the last 150 years. And I, I think what he's intending to do is to try to turn Ukraine into a place that is not going to be a problem for him or his country or anybody else in the world, as as was the case prior to 2014, when the USA destabilized it and uh, intruded in its uh, in its govern governance. And um, uh, I think that he is going to try to conclude this military operation sooner rather than later. Uh, it would be to his advantage if, if he did it sooner rather than later, I, I think. The only question is, are the uh, leaders of Western Civ mad enough, insane enough to provoke him to some uh, terrible enormity like an exchange of nuclear missiles? That concludes part one of our interview. Part two will be available soon in the subscribers area at LegalizeFreedom.com. LegalizeFreedom.com <laughs>